Welcome to Packolution. In this podcast series, you'll hear the experts of the packaging industry talking about sustainability and the future of packaging. It is brought to you by Vatron and hosted by one of its founders, Michaela Wachtel and sales director Ton Knipscher. Welcome to another episode of Packolution, the disruptive podcast brought to you by Vatron. Today, we have Patrick Poitevin as our guest, with whom we'll be talking about his extensive career in packaging. Welcome, Patrick. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your career path? Because yours is particularly special as it covers a wide spectrum. Yes, I'm a chemist from background, but I never worked as a chemist. So I started with the ST Lauder, which is a cosmetics, fragrances, personal care. And that was based in Belgium. And that was in the end of the 70s where I started there. And that was mainly in quality control. And that's how I ended up in packaging, quality control of packaging, incoming inspection, incorporating as well as self-auditing, incorporating as well self-certification. And I was uh, 18 years there with Estee Lauder, which was premium brands. Uh, what I had, it's like uh, that time it was clinic prescriptives, uh, Estee Lauder itself, Aramis. Uh, since then, of course, there's a lot of other brands uh, came along. I think it's now about uh, 20 or 30 brands. And I left there in 97 uh, because I was eager to do something differently. I thought, well, I'm not married to Estee Lauder and I would like to do something differently. And I went in to um, the food industry uh, was Nestle and I was okay. still in Belgium and that was in the dairy uh, shield industry which was more mass market like yogurts and like rice puddings etc mm -hmm. which was uh, quite interesting but then uh, Nestle decided to close that site and I had the option to go or to the Netherlands or to France but my girlfriend at that time was British so it was more difficult because I was commuting Britain uh, Belgium on a weekly basis and the flights were uh -huh. quite cheap and easy and it was from Antwerp so it was quite close to home and then That's uh, why I decided not to take it. And then I was approached by Campina, which is now Friesland Campina. And mm -hmm. that was in Alter near Ghent. Yeah. And that's where I started then uh, as well in packaging innovation. And packaging innovation that time was quite innovative because it was fresh milk and bringing fresh milk into PET bottles instead of glass. So it was with uh, caps with um, oxygen scavengers and with PET where from end to end on the line, it, it needed to be completely uh, developed. And then uh, by a certain, after only two years or so, one of the headhunters noticed that I was in in England quite often and for me um an opportunity at Coty and Coty is as well uh, cosmetics uh, on yes. the coast mm -hmm. in Ashford and uh, they do Lancaster I did develop uh, lipsticks uh, let's say for Jennifer Lopez which was quite interesting to have her uh, on the phone let's say like, like that time well, it was not yet Zoom or, or Teams or whatever but it was oh, uh, that's a pity. <laughs> just a conference call yeah and I, yeah. Never met, I never met her face to face to be honest okay. uh, and while I was uh, testing a lipstick for her I, I never saw her lips either to be honest <laughs> <laughs> from close by but it was quite interesting and I did there the, the innovations in terms of lipsticks I introduced a lubricant free uh, lipstick mechanisms I did a mini lipstick which was that time a completely innovative different mascara brushes etc so it was quite a bit of travel uh, like usual for, for the cosmetics uh, travel involved in the Far East mainly Thailand uh, Taiwan China etc that was quite interesting and after about three or four years uh, with the color cosmetics uh, I went to Marks and Spencers. So again, completely different. They don't produce anything themselves. Quantities are quite challenging and small. It is a premium product because Marks and Spencers was and is still an institution in Britain, let's say. Yes. So uh, it was quite interesting. So from premium Estee Lauder, sometimes premium and mass market at Coty because ports, uh, etc. There was quite mass market as well with Nestle, uh, which was also mass market. There was quite a bit of variance. And with S uh, with Marks and Spencer, I stayed about again another three years, and then I went to a full service supplier, which was that time called Cozy. 
and we did developments and I was doing the packaging innovation for main and big brands, in fact, like a PNG, like Unilever, uh, L'Oreal, and also Estee Lauder. So I did quite a bit of innovations in terms of makeup cases, etc., or mm-hmm. bottles, which was quite interesting. And a lot of measurements as well in terms of equipment, so measurement of skin tones, etc. So uh, because in the meanwhile, although I was a chemist from background, I did a lot of studies in, in between. So uh, I've done qualifications, let's say, in colorimetry or viscosimetry and HPLC, uh, so liquid chromatography. Anything what I had to do and could help me as well in packaging and definitely in packaging compliances, etc. Besides that, of course, with my hobby in astronomy, I did a, a lot of qualifications as well in meteorology, uh, just watching the weather and observing and measuring the weather and uh, navigation. But I'm as well a solar physicist as well in, in the meanwhile, not to show off of what I'm doing because my wife, which now passed away, she always said it's, it's toilet paper because qualifications doesn't mean anything. And she's right in that one. <laughs> so um, after Marks and Spencer, sorry, I'm diverting now. After Marks and Spencer, I went to Cozy to the full service supplier and they went in receivership. And then people in how it works, in fact, with networking, people at Cadbury, they knew I was available and they said, are you interested to do some contract work for us? Because we are moving quite a bit of products to Poland, from England to Poland, and that was that time Green and Blacks, which was as well subcontracted, and then let's say like the Mini X, Milk Tray, etc. And I said, yeah, why not? So I traveled on a weekly base for about a year and a half to Poland on behalf of Cadbury and then I had some offers from other companies for a permanent contract and I mentioned to Cadbury uh, well I would like to have permanent contract uh, I'm not really focused on doing contract work although it's always well paid etc so and they offered me a, a permanent contract and uh, I've been there the last 15 years Cadbury became Kraft Foods Kraft Foods had a spin-off with uh, Kraft Heinz and then the Mondelez uh, became the confectionery site and originally I worked only on the chocolate based in Burma but then I became global as well for, for chocolate and then I became as well cross-category. So the last, I think, eight or nine years, I worked cross-category and globally and I did all the innovations. I was leading, in fact, the digital technologies and that is, of course, digital printing, digital cutting, digital finishes, but also printed electronics, augmented reality, virtual reality, etc. anything what has digital to do with. And that's what I introduced. I introduced, for instance, 2012 augmented reality at Cadbury uh, for the Olympics, which was quite innovative. I started already with Mark and Spence with digital printing, and that was more than 20 years ago then. And I introduced a lot of activations um, within Cadbury or Mondelez. Besides that, the last five years, I was also focused on, because I'm, at the end, I'm a material scientist. I'm a nerd in terms of materials, etc. <laughs> so and, and compliances. So I worked a lot on sustainability and flexible papers. So how can we uh, make flexible papers equal in terms of shelf life, in terms of compliances, in terms of barriers, etc. Also machinability, so mechanical and chemical. How can we compare that and make it equal to plastics or flexible plastics? So that's where I've been working on the last five years. I have one question in between. My head is still spinning all the functions you've had. But there's one of the things which intrigues me. How do you test lipstick? How do you test lipstick? That is do you do you put this on yourself? Just out no, of curiosity. No. Okay. You, okay. I have no idea. You develop different test methods, and that uh-huh. is, for, for instance, the bullet retention. So I did a lot uh-huh. of development in bullet retention. So the go there, which is the lipstick itself, needs uh-huh. to be, in fact quite severe or holding in that plastic part. So mm-hmm. you do, in fact, a test. It's kind of a drop test, but it is specifically a drop test, which is okay. defined for lipstick itself. And then the breaking point as well. So the angle how you put your lipstick on is as well in different angles. Mm-hmm. And that is quite important as well to test that. And that is the breaking point of the lipstick. So you do it in various ways and you develop uh, your own machinery, but it is related of how the lady uses the lipstick or not necessarily the lady but also the man can use a lipstick of course these days like lip balms or lip blocks or whatever yeah, yeah, so yeah. but it is most of the time in fact equipment what you design yourself and that is part of packaging at the end as well yeah 
you've had quite a career and in our pre-interview you also mentioned that you're active in vision hunters pack mm -hmm. hub and advisory for pack so could you please give us a brief outline of what these services are and what role they play in the packaging sector so vision hunters is a consultancy agency based in finland in helsinki and they are focused or they were focused on everything what has to do with wood or the forest or the sustainability energy etc but also the availability of wood everywhere in the world as well and also in papers or it is papers or it is gardens anything what has to do with papers papers and labels papers and magazines or newspapers etc and to where there was a gap and that's why they uh, contacted me was in packaging and with the growing demand of flexible papers uh, that's why they contacted me and that's where i'm fulfilling as a senior associate in fact i'm not really i have a contract with them but i'm not really fully employed with them so i do contract work with them and i work along with paper mills i, I work along with coating suppliers with converters with machine suppliers as well and with brand owners and it's not just mondelez but it is also other brand owners where i'm uh, helping out uh, in fact, Vision Hunters to make sure that flexible papers can be used within their brand and within their industry or regions or so. So that is uh, Vision Hunters. And then there is the backup, which is UK based, uh, but also we're working globally and uh, they have an innovation zone. It, it's, it's Paul Jenkins, uh, also a very good connection for yourself as well. And uh, Paul in the podcast as well. Correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Paul uh, and I, we are going along for a very long time uh, together uh, where we are meeting each other very often we have a lot of conversations etc and he was as well interested to have me on board as a technical director not that the name means anything but packaging support so i do a lot of projects in the background for paul in fact and support anything what has to do with technical aspects or it is for brand owners or it is as well for associations now for instance i'm leading in fact uh, one of the faces of the holy grail for the uh, european brand association so and that is a Along with Paul, Paul uh, brought me in contact and he asked me if I was interested to do and then support. And I'm traveling quite a bit lately in, in terms of the recycling systems and make sure that the Holy Grail uh, phase three will work well, uh, that uh, all the tests and, and the trials will work well. So that is the backup, but also for the backup, I um, bring in as well some work for the backup as well, where companies contact me and where I say, okay, it's not as technical as I would like to have. I'm not keen and interested to do so. So, but maybe a backup uh, can, can support from one angle or another angle in terms of commercials or whatever, as from marketing point of view as well. And then there is the advisory for PAC, which I have set up myself because once you start doing contracts, you have to set up yourself in the UK as a business. So I started the limited company just for tax reasons and for compliance reasons with the government. And then I take as well smaller contracts on, or it is a digital printer in Japan, or it is in the States or any other organization where I do some work for. So I'm doing quite a bit of smaller contracts as well and mainly it is about the digital printing or compliances because what I've decided for myself is anything what is fiber related I would like to do that via vision hunters because they have a good database and they have a good team as well and we're working really close together as a team anything what is fiber related on my own advisory for pack although I don't charge anything I support quite a lot of startup companies startup companies mainly in Israel because they are very active very innovative and they are also supported by the Israeli uh, government as well but but also startup companies in France or in Germany, it's at anywhere, in fact, where startup companies contact me and they say, well, I would like to have uh, some advice and some help in, in terms of packaging materials. Because just to give you an example, a startup company can work on, for instance, plant-based food or plant-based salmon, let's say, and they are looking for packaging. The product is not exactly as the original product, but the looks, the taste needs to be the same. So also the packaging is quite important that the consumer can see that the packaging, that the shelf life is in place, that the compliance is in place, etc. So that's where I'm helping out with uh, those kind of startup companies or 3D printing of steak or of meat or something like that. The reason I'm working with those startup companies because they are so dynamic, they're so passionate and I'm passionate myself about packaging and what I'm doing. And that's what keeps 
people going, in fact. Whatever you do, you have to do it with passion. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. As most of our listeners by now know, sustainability is the focus of our podcast. What yeah. sort of movements have you seen in your long career in this regard at the companies you worked for and the companies you're still advising and helping, Patrick? Yeah, it's a very good question, in fact, because indeed sustainability might be now on the top of everybody's company. And that is mainly, in fact, like NSA, like David Dettenborough, whatever, when he shows things that fish, et cetera, they, they have plastic or wrapped in plastic, et cetera. But sustainability has been always a bit on the agenda. When I was with Estee Lauder, I was, one of my focus and developments was clinic products, for instance, which is allergy free, et cetera. And then that time, and that was in the 80s, or early 80s, where I'm talking about, we starting with das grüne Punt, the green dots, in Germany, but we won't have that incorporated as well in our product. So sustainability has always been on the agenda. And then you start with PET bottles, where when you start using recycled material in your PET bottles, you move out PVC, for instance. So sustainability has always a little bit been there, but more on the background. And sometimes, if I may say, and I dare to say that as well, used and abused in the wrong way, because it is like we're going to do here some lightweight versions or we're going to yeah. do some cartons etc and that was in the benefit of the companies to make cost reductions so okay. that's where i'm saying using and abusing and with saying okay this is for this sustainability no it was to increase their margins more or less and we have to yeah. be fair and open to each other and bigger companies are a little bit like that and yes they have spoke as well to an ex-colleague and they're saying as well well bigger companies they have kind of sustainability on their agenda because they have to. They don't have yet the passion. There are people, of course, in that company, in those big companies who have the passion, but I think the main peers, etc., they're doing it for their shareholders at the end, and they need to have a goal, and they need to have a pledge, let's say, okay, by 2025, we're going to reach that, and we're doing that, and by 2030, we're going to do that. But I have the feeling, and we had that conversation yesterday, that bigger companies don't have the same drive as smaller companies, as individuals, let's say. But sustainability has always been on the agenda of many companies for as long as I know in packaging in 45 years, let's say. In recent years, there has also been an increase in new legislation aimed at forcing companies to be more sustainable. But is there also someone who checks whether these goals of the companies have been met or achieved? You have a lot of experience from your company, so maybe you can tell us something about your experience. Aha, uh -huh. that is uh, uh, an interesting question. And it is like a question where I have to be really careful with in what I'm going to say, because not everybody is going to like that. Of course, there's legislations. I wouldn't say... It's always legislations. There are guidelines, and but there will be legislations more and more popping up. Let's say by the end of this year, next year, etc. There will be more formal guidance. Let's say of what companies have to do in terms of sustainability. Also, how to record and how to measure, in fact, their recording. Because I remember I was once in a conference a few months ago, and they were saying, well, by 2023, the companies have to give their estimates. Well, estimates are still. Going going to be an estimate and not an accurate measure. So, and indeed, who is following up? There are some organizations, let's say, like just to give an example, the Alan MacArthur, and they do some follow-ups if the pledges, what the companies have placed on their websites and also made public and they do check let's say okay is that company now 100% recycled materials uh, using etc or uh, do they use the 25% recycled contents what they pledge etc because 2025 is in front of the door so many companies are still behind same question as well there was a plan A from Marks and Spencers a few years ago who has checked that plan A really was successful and fulfilled of course it's good that people make pledges and some people I've never done it myself make resolutions by the end of the year or in the new year I've never done it because I think you can make a resolution every day to be honest in what you're going to do and have you achieved what you wanted to do that particular day for instance but I think what should be done and I discussed it last week as well in one of the uh, meetings that I was involved in, there should be a penalty, in fact. If you make a pledge, it needs to be achieved. Otherwise, it's not a pledge anymore. Or it's not formal anymore. So if you don't reach your goal, 
there should be a penalty point and there should be auditors, in fact, who are checking if you have made that one. It's the same like an audit for quality, an audit for sustainability, for health and safety, etc. It should be exactly the same. There should be an independent body in place who does randomly audits by companies or from companies to check if they have achieved it, what they are saying or preaching. Because otherwise it becomes just a, a PR stunt, let's say, that they make a pledge and that it is not achieved. And who, who bothers them? What is your achievement then at the end? So yeah, that is kind of, there needs to be more legislations in place and not just guidelines, but there needs to be as well control systems in place as well. Yeah, that's right. Otherwise, it's just empty statements. Correct. Yeah. Throughout every economic crisis, it becomes quite clear that sustainability gets less attention and uh, there is always the risk that it disappears off the radar. What experiences have you had in this field so far? And is it also a conflict between budget and productivity? Exactly. You see, in fact, it's like a curve, yeah, and goes with ups and downs. It's like a roller coaster within companies. And it's in every company the same. It's not just in the last 15 years where I was, or it has been as well in previous companies. Sometimes there is a fluctuation. Okay, we have to focus here on innovation. And then the company sees as well the shareholders are not that happy. So we have to do some productivity. We have to do some cost savings here. Where are we going to do cost savings? Packaging always has been squeezed out so much, made it so light made it so cheaper that it was hard to do some savings there but still a productivity always comes back it's like a boomerang yeah you do innovation today but next year the innovation is then pushed aside okay we have to do some productivity and automatically sustainability is related to it because you can do innovation and sustainability but most of the time sustainability will be more expensive and of course there's many organizations they're saying well the millenniums or the people would like to pay more when it is sustainable well nobody has proven that yet to me in facts and figures in surveys yes in questionnaires people will say of course that they do that but in fact realistically as everybody or or anybody, any checkups on the market that indeed there will be more people buying sustainable materials. So sustainability has always been a bit in the background. And that's where we really have to focus. And that's where I'm saying as well, like it needs to be with penalty points and fines, let's say, financial fines, if they don't reach it. But that is quite important, in fact, that that sustainability stays and is on the foreground. There is, of course, now more and more organizations focused on it. So companies have to to be focused on sustainability. But let's say, just to give you an example, if you are changing plastic flexibles into flexible paper, for instance, paper is more expensive, it's more weight, etc. So there is already quite a bit of implications from the product point of view. So the company, the brand owner will have less margin because you really can't force that to the consumer to pay more because we are changing here into a more sustainable material. That is not fair. I don't think it is correct. So it is more expensive, less margin. So that is very hard for businesses and brand owners to change over because it is less margin. How do these changes that occur due to sustainability and guidelines influence the entire supply chain? For example, in terms of price, you, you mentioned the brand owner can't increase the price, but what do they do? Do they take it out of their margin? Do they do anything else? How does yeah. this work? You have to look at it uh, as well from the complete supply chain point of view, not just mm -hmm. like for like comparing materials. Let's say plastic with, with paper. We know the price difference is there already, but the mm -hmm. whole supply chain, because the inbound is already uh, more expensive because uh, paper weights heavier. So you can't get that many reels, for instance, on the inbound on a pallet. So you have more lorries, etc. Outbound, exactly the same. You can't get that many products in a box because paper has a thickness, has a weight. So also there you have more boxes, you have more pallets, you have more uh, trucks, let's say on the road. So from the whole supply chain point of view, there will be more than an increase just of the material. And to me, brand owners see now as well about five years ago when i started with it's like yeah we're never going to do that because it is too much uh, increase in cost but now more and more the brand owners see as well that they will have in fact uh, an impact in the world let's say if they're not changing it over if ritter for instance is changing over everything in paper and also brands like a, a mars and a, like a nestle they're doing already mm -hmm. some test markets in paper 
type of materials because one is still with metallization, the other one is still with uh, plastic on the inside. So if one brand doesn't do it, well, they are a little bit behind and the consumer, it has a bad impact, let's say, a, a bad perce a perception. And that's where brand owners have to incorporate in their price, in their less margin indeed, because I feel and I don't think they're going to increase the price because it is a sustainable material. I don't think the consumer will take it that easy, in fact, that they say, no, it is the, the brand's responsibility to make uh, their product, in fact, uh, with a sustainable uh, packaging material. So that is still a watch out, in fact, because yeah, I've not seen yet big brands with their power brand, let's say, to change over, or it is a Mars. It's all test markets at the moment. It's all smaller runs, but it is not yet the big hoo-ha. It's not like Kit Kat is, is changing all over everywhere in the world into paper. Not yet. The same for Cadbury. Cadbury is not changing everything in the world in a flexible paper. And that uh, will be quite interesting to see how their price is going to be. Are they going to make the size of the chocolate a little bit smaller, like they sometimes do? Or are brand owners changing in one way or another the pack or the product it sells as well? I don't know. That will be quite challenging, interesting to see. You mean it's inflation, as they call it? Yeah, exactly. Like that. That's right. You mentioned digital printing before. And when you mm -hmm. talk about digital printing, you usually also think of personalization. Mm -hmm. And from a consumer perspective, you have to admit that personalization is always a powerful marketing tool, like the Coke bottles with names on them. But how does this affect production? I can imagine that it is significantly more cost intensive and slows down production doesn't it? Yes and no, yeah. One thing I have to apologize uh, if I do correct, the Sherry Coke is not personalization. It is customization because it is randomly. They didn't make that particular label with your name on there because if you go, for instance, in, in the Far East or whatever, they have chosen or it is 300 or 500 names which were popular in that particular country. It is, to me, customization. Sorry, I'm a bit like a nerd in digital printing. But that's fine. You're, you're absolutely right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Personalization is if somebody, I'm going to order something with my full name on there, Patrick, and not just Patrick, but also my last name, etc. That is personalization when it's really from the manufacturer, in fact, to the person itself. So any digital printing has been used so far mainly for personalization and customization. With the, the Share Coke, that was a logistics challenge. And I know the numbers as well of what they have done and how they did it as well. So it was printed in conventional printing, then went to the digital printing to do the last stage naming and that has to be done digitally because then you can make it randomly because if you have for instance a rotogravure and you have a cylinder and you have for instance six different reels on one big model reel and then the circumference or how do you say that with the diameter of the cylinder you can get three impressions of it yeah that's it yeah so you can have 15 different graphics for instance but then Every reel has still the same configuration. With digital printing, you can make it completely random. And that is the advantage. And that's a logistic part of you. And with the Coca-Cola, it was quite complicated how they did it from the random point of view. So conventional, then digital, and back conventional because it was the overcoating as well. And then the slitting and then bringing it as well in random on the market via the converter, etc. So that was really unique. And that has been like kind of uh, the push for many brands to do something differently. I worked, for instance, on the Oreo and uh, we did personalization so the consumer could order their Oreo via the web pages, made their own design, made their own text and logos and uh, icons on there. And uh, we collated during the day all the input from the web pages. During the night, we were doing the digital printing. The next day, it was uh, cutting, slitting, packing off, etc., and send it then by via Federal Express to the 50 states in the United States. So that's even Alaska, Hawaii, whatever. And within four days, the consumer got their personalized pack of Oreo, a big brand, also complicated because it was that time a PE, PE 
CT laminate. So you had to do the reverse printing on the top layer of uh, the, the PET and then laminating, slitting, etc. So it was, I'm not saying complex, but it was uh, as well logistically kind of um, challenging and incorporating as well. To your question as well, is it slowing down? It automatically slows down because your digital printing is already slower. When I started with digital printing, the speed was that time 30 meters a minute. If you compare it with Rotograph View, 500 meters a minute, you can't compare one to another. Now the digital printing has been improved by width. You have now as well the wide web uh, digital printing, still smaller than modern reels, for instance, in the Rotograph View, but also the speed. You have now speeds as well in 120, etc. If you're thinking about food compliance inks, and then I'm talking about the electro inks, etc. If you're talking about a digital ink shedding, which you can use on cartons, etc., but it's not yet compliant for flexible materials, then it goes already faster. So indeed, it slows down, but it has a lot of advantages as well. And a lot of companies see digital printing still only for personalization and customization, while I'm really preaching and doing presentations for or the Smithers and whatever about why not bring it in-house, because with end of line. When you bring it in-house, you can do really shorter runs to the market. You can have test markets. You can do as well personalization. As long as your supply chain is modified and adapted for it, you print, for instance, uh, Albert Heijn tomorrow. Uh, you print Tesco's, let's say, after tomorrow. So you can do more personalization and you give a lot of information about sustainability at the same time, more up-to-date information on your packaging as well. So that is the advantage of doing that. If you look at it from the cost point of view, okay, digital printing is more expensive, but uh, what you win as well, if you do it inline or near line, you don't have any inventory. You only have one blank material for that kind of material. I always take the example as Toblerone. Toblerone is one item, but it is 60 SKUs in terms of different flavors, in terms of different countries, ingredients, etc. And you reduce that into one. So you have only one carton to bring in. Of course, it's not just the digital printing. You have the cutting, decreasing, the gluing as well, what you have to bring in house. And maybe as well a hybrid version because the background is beige, let's say, that you can do that in Inflexo or in or so and then what you avoid is as well is your obsolescence so you only print what you need and for where you need it so from the sustainability point of view you reduce already your inventory you reduce your obsolescence because no brand owner will tell you how much scrap they have on packaging but also on filled products in fact because ingredients legislations are changing over the years or over the months and they have to change because it is not suitable and more for the market where they normally ship. So there is a lot of sustainability advantages with it, but also cost advantage. There is, an, of course, an investment. And what I always found is like we have to bear two uh, important uh, points in your mind, and that is skills, because brand owner is skilled, of course, in the products or what they're producing. They are a confectioner or they're a food or a pet manufacturer, let's say. They are not printers. So you have to bring, in fact, expertise from the printing unit you have bought and work together with that kind of supplier. And the other part is as well the compliances that do the checks because now currently packaging material is checked by your converter, stroboscopic or with video or artificial intelligence or whatever. And that's what you have to bring in line as well because who says that the ingredients is right? Who says that the color is right? You can't expect the operator from your machine, from your pack-off machine to do that all. And that is quite important because if you have an ingredient, for instance, and it's 1.5 fat contents, let's say, and the dot is gone, it is 15% that you're not legal anymore. So you have to make sure that your due diligence is in place as well. So Patrick, we've reached the end of this episode. Is there anything you'd like to add? Because you have such a vast experience in packaging and packaging development. It's almost mind boggling. I, I don't feel it like that, just that I'm hungry for newness, etc. I think packaging has never been boring. If I look at it, indeed, I've been 45 years in, in packaging and I've never been bored because it keeps giving you new ideas, etc. Or it is materials, it is structural, it is functional, uh, mechanical, etc. It's never boring. It always uh, suits something. At the end, you don't do packaging on your own either. You work along. It is a lot of networking. It is a lot of collaboration. And I'm 
still old school in that sense. For me, a handshake with a supplier, a supplier is, is your colleague at the end. If you don't have your supplier and your handshake with your supplier, you can't do it on your own. And with packaging, it's exactly the same. Or it is internal where you have the connections with marketing, where you give them ideas, what is feasible, technically feasible, and what is not feasible, and how can we achieve it? And that is with the test markets these days where you have specific looks of the packaging where you can stand out, etc. That is really important that you work as well internally as externally. And that's where I think if you don't have the passion, don't do it then, yeah? And that is really important. And uh, where I always tell students or startup companies, go to exhibitions where you have a lot of machines there, where you have a lot of supplies there and talk and talk and talk. And that is really important that you have those connections, that network, and that works the best in fact. Uh, I think this is a fascinating aspect of packaging and it's not just from the mechanical and the physical point of view, but it is just in general because it brings you a lot of contact with, with a lot of people in the world as well. Yeah, I fully agree with that. But everything needs to be packed. As you say, rightfully, in my opinion, it is absolutely critical and vital that you meet many people and you go to exhibitions mm -hmm. and see the machines and see the materials. This yeah. is where you pick up the new innovations, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I see packaging evolving as well. And in the future, oh, yeah. and it won't be long anymore that you have touch screen packaging let's say you tap, tap on it and it gives you as well the information of the ingredients you see the farmer maybe on a little screen etc that is the future but it won't be that far off anymore where printed electronics is more integrated where it is as well safe as well of course from the uh, compliance point of view from the product point of view and also it, it will give you information as well where to dump it and there will be connections as well if you would put a bin and the bin will tell you no this is wrong here take it out because it needs to be in the bin next door here because yeah. of the different material. Also, those sorting systems where I'm working on as well, it's not just about holy grail, it's about the artificial intelligence, etc. where uh, packaging will be recognized. Okay, this is packaging, but it is polypropylene or it is PE, etc. That is the sorting systems will be in place as well. Yeah. Wow, it's, it's almost overwhelming, I'd say, the amount of experience you've shared with us. So thank you very much for sharing your experiences and vision with us. This concludes another episode of our podcast, Packolution. Very interesting for us and hopefully for our listeners as well. Thank you, Patrick, very much for sharing and let's keep packaging going. Please stay tuned in this channel for more inspiring episodes of Packolution with experts like Patrick in the packaging industry. Thank you.